afternoon, but I know that uh, really the only way that you can stay awake uh, during an afternoon speech is to give it, so I won't mind, Philip, or any of you been dozing off and catching a few winks over there. There's, as we look and travel around uh, and compare our agriculture in South Dakota to other states in the nation, it's quite evident to me that we're probably in the most agricultural state in the nation. More dependent upon the prosperity of agriculture to carry our state through and support our education and all the other programs in any state in the nation. Now, we have been arguing this back and forth with North Dakota for a few years as to which is the most agricultural state. However, since they started mining coal in their stock dams up there, I think they're going to leave that to us as being the most agricultural. But we are a very important agricultural state, and I don't think that there's any question the key to our financial growth, prosperity in this state, hinges directly on agricultural and agricultural uh, prices. There's only one thing that I can promise you for sure in serving as Secretary of Agriculture in this state, and that is as I make judgment and priorities in the department, that the prime consideration and the first priority is the family farm. I do have a strong background and a strong interest in that. I don't think there's any question that I consider myself on leave from the family farm, and I'm happy that I do have some boys and a wife who is interested in uh, keeping that going while I'm serving at this time in Pier. And I'm happy that they have an interest in farming, for they are now the fifth generation that's on that land. And I think as I look back at how agriculture has benefited me and some of the things and experiences that I had, I still credit my father for guiding me and uh, along the rural line and some of the things that he thought was very important, sometimes even greater than those of the current economic conditions. I'm very thankful for that opportunity that I've had to grow up in the rural areas, and I certainly hope I can pass that on to my family and through some continued generations. There's only one other area that, and I find myself still talking as a farmer and consider myself to be a farmer, but one other thing that I'd like to relate to you, and that's the dedication and the interest in South Dakota agriculture by the members of and the employees that are in Pier. We have four divisions in the department, Ag Regulations, Animal Health, and Meat Inspection, Marketing Division, and Conservation. And I can tell you that the four people who head up these uh, divisions are as dedicated and interested in agriculture in South Dakota as anyone. They devote some long hours, they meet with a lot of groups, and their main concern is to developing and carrying out programs that will benefit our state. We should remind ourselves again then as to how we compare with other states in the nation as far as agriculture is concerned. And we'll see that we rank in the top area of livestock and crops in, in many areas. We're fifth in beef cow numbers. We're seventh in hogs. We're fifth in sheep. We're ninth in livestock feeding. In the grain area, South Dakota has been the leading state in rye production. They've been second in flax. They've been third in durum wheat. They've been fourth in spring wheat. They've been fourth in oats. They've ranked high in other feed grains. So we have the potential of expanding our agricultural production here in South Dakota. One of the areas where I think we have fallen down and relating to consumers and others throughout the United States is really to tell the story of agricultural efficiency. And there are many areas that we could talk about. But agricultural productivity has doubled in the past 15 years. It has increased nearly twice as fast as non-farm industry. Farm output per man has increased each year at about a little over 5% rate, while non-farm productivity increased at a little over 2%. Today's farm worker produces food for over 50 people. There's no question that one of the main reasons that food remains the buy it is today is because of the efficiency of our farm operation. Our livestock are 130% more efficient than they were just 20 years ago. And today, 
back in the 1950s and, and uh, 15 to 20, it took 135 hours to produce 100 bushel of corn. Today, that's being done in this state with five to six hours labor. 100 bushel a week can be produced with uh, nine to 10 hours of labor. And this is just the start. I think we will become more efficient in the future. However, as we look at our consumer and, and labor throughout the United States, we're sometimes uh, very critical of some of their organizations and some of the labor organizations, where I think that we should take time to really look at these people and to realize that they are our best customers. We're not going to fully agree with their, their policies, but here in South Dakota, where we export practically all of the uh, or a high percentage of the food that we produce, 95% of the beef that we produce in this state is, is exported out of the state. A high percentage of the grain is sold to the consuming public in our large populated areas or in the world trade. But there's, as we look at the laboring person in this United States, they, on the average, they still spend less than 20% of their income for the food that they buy. And the average worker, by 4 o'clock on Monday afternoon, can purchase enough food to feed his family for one week. We're also offering the American consumer the greatest selection and the highest quality at the most reasonable price of any nation in the world. But we must remember that our food items compete with many non-food items in the household budget. Our laboring class of people are locked in to a lot of payments, house payments, car payments, and other pay So when they get done making those monthly payments, what's left for food is in direct competition with some luxuries, recreation, and other activities. All we have to do is read the paper, our magazines, listen to TV to see all the items that, are, that food is competing with. You may be interested in some of these that may be misleading or not telling the entire truth, you may have heard one of the newest claims, and that's for Preparation H. They don't claim that it will grow hair, but they say that it will shrink the head to fit what you have. So whether or not that you can believe this and other advertising claims is left to your imagination. One of the strongest areas that I think has benefited agriculture in South Dakota, and it's fine to see the signs over here that October is co-op month. I know from my hometown, I'm sure many of yours, that we rely heavily, heavily on the co-ops to keep the town going, to serve and supply the needs of farmers in that area. And we can look to, for co-ops to play a more active part in the future in supplying the goods and services that we need. One thing about our co-ops, when they make a, a profit, they put that back into an area that will produce a better good or service to the farmers in that area. As I see that, this is one of the problems that, that we have with some of our large corporations and conglomerates. They're so diversified that they become only interested in the profit and oftentimes reap profits from some of the businesses that they own and then just look for areas that they can return the greatest financial return rather really than really looking to see what they could do as far as goods and services are concerned. Some of these things do scare me. Last week we had the opportunity to be in Washington, visit the United States Department of Agriculture and the headquarters for the State Departments of Agriculture, and then attend the National Convention in West Virginia where 47 states were represented. One of the first things that the executive secretary mentioned to me in Washington was that the week before he had had a delegation from one of the oil producing uh, countries that is in OPEC. They were inquiring about wheat land, wheat yields, climate in South Dakota. For their in They were interested in purchasing land in this area. Later that week, I run into a lawyer who has a client in one of the southern states that has $500,000 that he wants to invest in agricultural land. He doesn't care what area of the United States it's in. He doesn't care if it makes a profit. His only requirement 
is that it would give enough return to make the payments and that they would hedge on inflation and the opportunity to sell that land in the future at a capital gain. These are some of the things that I think we are concerned with and they are real. We've done a good job of producing. We've probably spent most of our time on our farms increasing our production and in one area that I think cooperatives have helped us and an area we're going to have to be more concerned and that is an area of marketing. Beans we do uh, compete directly with so many of these non-food uh, food items, we're going to have to look at better marketing systems and probably through the co-ops will give us our best opportunity. But without a question, I think in the near future the key to our economic well-being and agriculture will hinge upon our farm exports. Even some of our largest financial magazines such as Newsweek, News World and Report now recognize that our best chance for a balance of agricultural payments, our best chance to hold down the national deficit lies in the field of agriculture and the ability to sell our agricultural products. We know that it is extremely important that we sell these farm products to offset some of the high prices for the things that we must import, such as oil. We've heard so much about importing oil and last year, if I remember correctly, our cost of importing oil was about $25 billion. But at the same time we exported nearly enough agricultural products to pay for that oil, about $22 billion. We know that there are many areas in the world that want our farm products, but now is the time for all of us who are involved in agriculture to be sure that we can share in some of the economic benefits that this opportunity offers us. Much of the world is now looking towards the United States for a dependable food supply. Last week at the National Convention, by a unanimous vote, the Convention Pass of the State Departments of Agriculture passed a resolution and sent it to the President requesting that the President of the United States eliminate foreign trade manipulations by federal agencies such as the State Department and Department of Labor and to involve and make the Agriculture Department the lead agencies in trade negotiations in the future. We should stand up and we should definitely see that the Department of Agriculture takes a lead in this area. I think it is disgusting to many of us when we can find that the Department of State or a, a head of a labor organization can get immediate attention either in the USDA or in the president's office. Any of these actions that we take I think will help to stabilize our economy. It will certainly provide more jobs and it will give a much favorable balance of trade and add to the strengthening of the dollar here in the United States. As we are involved now with our farm organizations, we have a definite part in government and a definite part to cooperate with our farm organizations. If we look over here at your slogan, agriculture built the past, agriculture is the future. As we go into this bicentennial year, and nearly 200 years, if we look back to 200 years ago when nearly nine out of every 10 people lived on the land, Till the day when there's only four out of ten, we realize that we're going to have to rely on many of our consumers and people who do not live on the land to pass farm legislation, to pass agricultural trade a policy. We have a big job to do in public relations. We have a greater challenge in management on the individual farm as we look to the use of more credit, more efficiency, we're going to see, I think, without a question, uh, improved efficiency through research and with our livestock, improved efficiency and greater crop yields. We're going to become more involved in conservation. We've made some real progress in the past 20 to 30 years, but we should take a very active part to assure that we can make the best use of our farmland. And we do need to be concerned about some of the things that are happening in Washington that could affect this. 
would only have to look at the recent ruling by the Corps of Engineers as far as their dredge and fill operations which could affect land use on all of our farms. We can only look at some of the recent decisions by the Environmental Protection Agency as far as the use of fertilizer, water quality, and other areas. And again, as we increase our marketing, being more involved in farm exports, and to spend more time with efficiency and marketing of our agricultural products, which I think is especially important here in South Dakota due to the fact that we have such high quality products. We can look at our grain. Here we have our wheat that is running 18, 19 percent protein in some cases. This is the quality that our millers, our foreign exporters would like to purchase. We look at our livestock. We produce some of the highest quality meat. We can look, example of this is in the swine industry. In the past 17 years, we have reduced the fat content of carcasses 50 percent. I wonder how much pork we would be selling today if we had the same quality product that we had 15 to 20 years ago. There are many challenges in South Dakota agriculture. I don't believe there's ever been a time when we have a right to say that we're proud to be a farmer any more than we do today. And the right to tell everyone in the United States who may not think he's so closely related to agriculture that if he eats, he is part of American agriculture and American agriculture has served him for the past 200 years and provided them the most reasonable and best buys of food of any nation in the world and that they will continue to do that in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, we're proud to be farmers and uh, we're proud uh, to have you for our Secretary of Agriculture. We were not at all disappointed uh, with your first appearance, appearance at our convention, believe me. Okay, uh, if I can have, hey, let's have that drawing while the... Uh... And good afternoon to all of you. I was real pleased to accept the invitation that Ben extended to me uh, to be part of your state convention this year because I do believe it's important that we report to you once each year what's happening in your regional farm supply cooperative. During the time, Ben, that, uh, that Lee was reading the annual audit, Duane Martinson uh, brought to my attention. Okay, is that better? During the time that Lee was reading the annual audit this afternoon, uh, Duane Martin brought to my attention that Senex and the cooperatives that are affiliated with Senex, the educational funds together amounted to $218,000, which is 51% uh, been of the total disbursements for 1975. And, and we just wish it to be a lot more. <clears throat> I would like, before uh, I get started this afternoon, uh, to ask uh, all of the Senex employees if they'd stand, please. Believe me, uh, uh, our educational funds would be a lot less, I'm sure, if it wasn't for a great group of employees out here that keep moving that product. Great. And managers also. And of course, all of you, all of you know our two directors from South Dakota that, that uh, uh, are on the board of directors at Farmers Union Central Exchange, Duane Mortensen and Roy Copper. <laughs> Speaking of educational funds, I'm sure that if every Farmers Union member constantly kept in mind that each time that he walked into a cooperative affiliated with the Central Exchange and made a purchase, or each time that he walked into a cooperative affiliated with GTA and bought feed or, or sold a load of grain, that additional educational funds would be generated that would help toward working toward a brighter future. And I believe that if every, if every member kept that in mind, that probably the sales would even be a lot greater than they are been. It's such a great worthwhile cause. Well, throughout the history of your Farmers Union organization, Senex and our sister regional GTA have shared many common goals. I believe that this close relationship 
that we've enjoyed has always been important, but never more important than it is today. As farmers become an increasingly smaller segment or percentage of our population, they need the strongest voice possible, and together our organizations can give farmers a stronger voice. And we do need that voice. Farmers do need that voice today because it's altogether too easy for the farmer's voice to be lost in the hubbub of national politics or probably global diplomacy. Farmers need to be heard, and I think that there are indications that they are beginning to be heard. The summer the president was on a swing through the upper Midwest. He took the opportunity to deliver a major farm speech to a large rural audience at the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines. In that speech, the president said, and I quote, a sound, fully productive agriculture is a key element in our nation's quest for peace. Our sale of grain and other foodstuff to the rest of the world is one of the brightest areas in our economy, a grain harvest that we truly can all understand. What the president said is something that I think that many of us in agriculture, many of, in this, of us in this room already knew, already understood. Agriculture in America today is an entirely new ball game. And the stakes in this ball game are unbelievably high. Other nations are relying on our farmers and their ability to produce almost half of the world's needs for food export, almost half. The stakes in this ball game are world peace, a peace that balances ever so delicately today between peace and chaos. President Ford made another point to his Iowa audience. If the United States and our farmers suddenly, for some unforeseeable reason, had to give up or end our enormous agricultural exports, it would mean a loss in income of $12 billion. That's pretty important. The fact is that our agricultural exports are the biggest single contributor that we have to the nation's balance of trade. We're in the black. This agricultural abundance is keeping our balance of payments in the black, and as a nation, our exports of wheat, corn, and soybeans are the only means that we have to pay for the costly foreign oil that we import to fuel our tractors for agriculture. And as Bob Duxbury was saying a little while ago, there is no other way that we can pay for that foreign oil. There is no other way that we can keep our balance of payments in the black. Yes, U.S. agriculture today is an entirely new ballgame, and I believe it's very fitting that agriculture should achieve such tremendous prominence just as America celebrates its 200th anniversary. 200 years ago, when the Founding Fathers were shaping our Constitution and forming a government, there were only about 800 or 900 million people in the world to feed. Today, the world feeds about 4 billion, and it's estimated that in two and a half decades from now, by the year 2000, we'll have to learn to feed approximately seven and a half billion people. And I know that there's been a lot of people over the years running around on soapboxes telling about world famines and so forth that we can't feed our people. But it is a fact, ladies and gentlemen, that we will need to feed seven and a half billion people in just another short 25 years. Based on the record production American farmers have achieved, I think there's reason to be optimistic that we can help the world accomplish this goal of feeding seven and a half billion people. In 1972, we exported 45% of the world wheat that traded hands. The next year, we exported over half, 56% of the total feed grains imported by other countries. The United States is the only country in the world today blessed with such tremendous agricultural abundance. Even the Russians, with twice the land mass of America, and only about 42 million more people to feed than we have, find it unable to feed their people even in a good year. No doubt about it, American agriculture has reached newfound prominence today. Russia, Europe, and many of the underdeveloped countries are constantly looking to our farmers to produce at 100% of capacity. Yet if we're going to continue to produce at this pace, if farmers are going to plant every acre to achieve top yields, there is a tremendous challenge to Senex 
to your Farmers Union Central Exchange and other supply cooperatives to gear up to have the supplies that our farmers will need. The planning, the logistics of distribution, and the capital requirements are going to be unprecedented. It's going to take hundreds of millions of dollars, long-range planning, and some very serious commitments on the part of our farmers through their cooperatives to have the supplies that they need. Already, I think Senex has taken the first steps necessary to achieve this strong supply situation. We're seeing the wisdom and the foresight of our farmers, yes, and of our Senex board of directors in building and using their cooperative. In partnership with 18 other regional farmer cooperatives, we are presently involved in the largest expansion of fertilizer manufacturing facilities in our entire history. Through CF Industries, we're building three new nitrogen manufacturing plants in partnership with some Canadian cooperatives up in Alberta. Two new 30,000 ton ammonia terminals to bring this nitrogen to the upper Midwest are already under construction at Glenwood, Minnesota and Grand Forks, North Dakota. And when the first of these Alberta plants come on stream, about a year from now or less, it will begin supplying these terminals. To assure that these costly new nitrogen plants will be able to operate economically, CF Industries is participating in a substantial search for new supplies of natural gas, the primary feedstock to produce nitrogen fertilizer. Our ability to locate and secure new long-range supplies of natural gas will have an important bearing on our ability to produce nitrogen, and particularly to produce it at competitive rates. We've completed construction of a new granular urea nitrogen plant in Donaldsonville, Louisiana. Two new anhydrous ammonia plants will be built there as well, starting this year. In Florida, CF has expanded its phosphate manufacturing facilities. Additional acid plants are going to be built to upgrade phosphate rock. And when the Florida expansion is complete, it will mean that the production of phosphate will be just exactly doubled. Early this summer, another basic step to expand farmer ownership in the supply of plant food was the purchase of a large bed of high-quality phosphate rock in central Florida, which is located under a tract of 1,800 acres, now an orange grove. This reserve is expected to supply CF's needs, or the needs for the cooperative people, for at least 25 years phosphate ore reserves that you own, that all the cooperatives own. I believe there's enormous wisdom and foresight in farmers taking these steps for themselves. The period of fertilizer shortages that we experienced in 1973 and 74 is still fresh in the minds of many of us. Those shortages showed farmers how important their investment in their co-ops was. Not one ton of fertilizer produced by CF and distributed by Senex went to the lucrative export market. Every single ton went to its farmer owners. These shortages taught us another vitally important lesson. In the past, when fertilizer supplies were tight and when we would have to go on the outside to purchase, really about the only thing that we were doing was helping to somebody else to pay for their fertilizer plant. It seems that cooperatives, it seems that farmers' money ought to go to build their own plants rather than to help pay for somebody else's. And that's exactly what's going on today. Senex, along with 13 other regionals, formed a new interregional this past year called CF Feed Company. You might ask why CF is in, or why Senex is in this when we're not in feeds, at least not very wide geographically. It's very important that we do have access to dicalcium phosphate, which is used in the manufacturing of feeds. And we're very hopeful, and Barney has indicated on several occasions that even though they're not a member of CF in the manner of buying fertilizer, that GTA does hope to become a member of CF feeds in the not too distant future. We think this step is good for farmers, we think it's good for Senex, and we hope ultimately for GTA. It's a good example, I think, of 
what we can accomplish by working together. This fall, Senex is completing construction of a new seed corn plant in Cedar Falls, Iowa, right in the heart of the Corn Belt. The 100,000 bushel per year plant has already begun processing this year's crop, and we're really excited about the potential of being in the seed corn business. The plant is located in, there, in an area that's been virtually immune to crop failure over the years, assuring us of seed corn each year. And for the first time, we'll be able to supply local co-ops and farmers throughout the Senex trade territory seed corn. Those of you who don't mind being called old timers probably remember very well the days when your farmers union and Central Exchange were both young, budding organizations. The local supply co-ops, many of your parents helped to form in the rural areas back in the 30s and 40s, were really supply cooperatives for petroleum, weren't they? Many of those who helped organize the Farmers Union were instru instrumental in starting these supply cooperatives. Today, your state Farmers Union organization has become a powerful and effective voice on behalf of its members. And you're blessed with a good, strong national organization as well. Our co-ops have come a long way from those early fledgling days. Today, we're basic suppliers of fertilizer, chemicals, hardware, tools, some chemicals, appliances, and a wide assortment of other products. And as long as agriculture runs on energy, Senex will have an important role in supplying that product. There are some uncertainties in our energy future today, not the least of which is our dependence on foreign crude oil. Our neighbors to the north, the Canadians, say that they're determined to shut off the flow of oil exports to the United States by 1980, and I'm sure they will. No one doubts the seriousness of Canada's intentions. And we're very dependent on Canadian crude with our refinery at Laurel. Nevertheless, there are some bright spots and some promising efforts in our energy picture. And I believe it's vitally important that we explore every avenue possible today to improve our supply of petroleum. As the Trans-Alaska as the pipeline nears completion later this decade, we feel there's a strong possibility that the United States might be able to exchange Alaskan crude for Canadian crude, thereby keeping our refineries running. Canada has expressed some uh, interest in this type of a trade-off, and the exchange could have a significant impact on future oil supplies in the northern United States and much of the area that Senex serves. Domestically, Senex last year spent the largest amount of money in our history to find new sources of crude oil. We're presently producing about 4,600 barrels of domestic crude per day, and we're really enthusiastic about one of our newest drillings that's in southwestern Montana. And there, in the Rocky Mountains, we're drilling the deepest hole that we have ever drilled and hope that it'll be the biggest field that we have ever found. At Laurel, Montana, our refinery for most of the past two years has been under an expansion program. The refinery now has a capacity for 41,000 barrels per day of refined product. New modern equipment has been installed to increase our production of no lead gasoline. Also at Laurel, our refinery staff, staff is conducting studies of the feasibility to converse asphalt or road oil to refined products. It's extremely difficult to get rid of all of the asphalt that comes from a heavy asphalt crude oil. There are several other developments that Senex is looking at that could improve our petroleum supply considerably. In 1974, Senex joined in forming a new interregional petroleum co-op that's called the International Energy Cooperative. Early this year, this cooperative purchased a foreign exploration company that's called LVO International. When we purchased it, we also acquired concessions to overseas drilling rights. And for the past three months, 
seismographic crews have been working over in Egypt to determine where the oil reservoirs, or at least where they think they are, so that the first week in January, the first hole will be drilled 50 miles northwest of Cairo, Egypt, by cooperatives, of which the Central Exchange is the second largest owner. We're hoping that will ultimately result in a big field. <coughs> Excuse me. Each of these possibilities that I've been mentioning do require a tremendous investment. Tremendous investment for Senex and for many other cooperatives. We're not kidding ourselves about costs at all. Nevertheless, we're very optimistic with the potential of these studies and these projects, and we're extremely optimistic that we will be able to secure the supplies and added capacities that the farmers and the Senex family need. There's one other area of development at Senex with very far-reaching implication for local cooperatives and the farmers that Senex serves, and that's Operation Interface, which many of you have heard about or possibly read about. It's a lengthy, comprehensive study by Senex to evaluate virtually every aspect of service to local cooperatives and to farmers. Many results of the Interface study are already becoming a reality. Expansion of the Inver Grove Heights Distribution Center began this fall. During the next two or three years, three other large centralized distribution centers will be built, one in Aberdeen, South Dakota, one in Williston, North Dakota, and one in Pasco, Washington. And when completed, these four large distribution centers will cover about 20 acres of ground holding nothing but agricultural supplies. Each of the centers will inventory adequate supplies of products that you need from spring planting to harvest, yes, and throughout the winter months too. This is a very important program. During October, another result of Operation Interface was introduced to local cooperatives. This was a modern microfilm catalog and co-ops today, rather than thumbing through 2,300 pages and three large volumes of catalogs to find the product they want, can now look at 39 pages on microfilm and do the very same job. Another part of Operation Interface. These are a few of the tangible results of this important study. And in the months ahead, Further results will be announced, each of them designed to improve the service levels to your co-ops and in turn to help your local cooperative respond to your needs. Yes, your co-op has made tremendous strides in developing a strong organization, one that truly represents the needs of its members. Senex has come a long way from the day of the five-gallon petroleum bucket and the purchase of the Ma the refinery out in Montana. Together with farmers that we represent, we stand face to face today with an agricultural future that I think holds tremendous potential. Farmers in our country have pioneered an agricultural system that is second to none. It's the envy of the world. We know from the stern lessons that farming has taught us there will always be some downside risks. Agriculture will still have its shares of ups and downs. Yet the new ball game that agriculture finds itself in today, bolstered by the tremendous worldwide demand for our agricultural products, has reached such tremendous proportions that we might not be seeing the wide fluctuations or the high peaks and low valleys that we have in the past. <clears throat> Food has achieved new prominence in this country. And hand in hand with this prominence comes, I think, the greatest exposure or possibly liability that we've seen. Our exports become the target of some verbal shooting matches that are unfortunate. We've seen this already this summer. As sizable grain sales to the Russians were announced very prominently in the news media, consumers and others reacted adversely as food prices, and coincidentally, I think, also went up. Longshoremen at some seaports refused to load U.S. grain bound for Russia. 
these longshoremen and their union chief, George Meany, seized the food issue as the ammunition for their verbal arguments with Washington. It's unfortunate, perhaps, that agriculture's tremendous prominence has to expose farmers to become whipping boys for other voices. Farmers have built a large and efficient agriculture based in considerable part on export markets, and they've responded to calls for all-out production with record or near-record crops the past three years. Believe me, we need agricultural export markets. I think what consumers fail to understand is that really agriculture is their very, very best friend. All-out production to meet the needs of domestic and foreign demands is the most effective means available today to produce a reasonable market basket of food for the consumer. The consumer also needs to know that just because food prices rise, that doesn't necessarily mean that the farmer is getting a bigger return. Last year, for instance, while the retail price of the market basket of food rose 10 percent, and I think this was due to higher processing, higher transportation, higher retail markups, the value of that same market basket of food to the farmer fell almost 10 percent, 9.9 percent to be exact. A year ago in November, a one-pound loaf of bread cost an average of about 36 cents. At that time, wheat was selling for five dollars and a half. It was about eight cents worth of wheat in a loaf of bread. A year later, when wheat is selling now for about 4.45 a bushel, there's only six and a half cents worth of wheat in a loaf of bread. That same loaf of bread is selling for 48 cents, or up about 34 percent increase, Ben, in price. And yet we hear the consumer talking time after time, as well as George Meany, that if we export our grains and increase the price a little bit, the market becomes a little stronger, that the housewife is going to be paying a lot more for, for groceries. We certainly know better. The fact is our agricultural exports really have a very negligible effort, uh, effect, I should say, on the price that the U.S. consumer pays for a loaf of bread. The best assurance that our consumers have of a reasonable, dependable food supply is continued production at full capacity and free access for our farmer products to the export market. When George Meany and his long Sherman balked at loading grain bound for Russia, I think they were telling us something. And that something is that food, our agricultural abundance, has become one of the strongest bargaining tools in the world today, food. That's basically the same message that Ford brought to the Iowa State Fair this summer. And it's the message our exports are bringing to their foreign trading partners. We have in our hands a very powerful economic force. Our agricultural abundance is understood all over the world. With it, we can bring peace and a greater understanding to the world that needs to remember the common goal that we share. The wise, unrestricted distribution of our agricultural abundance can help feed a hungry world. It will keep our economy on a healthy, growing path, and it will assure a bright future for the farmers who have made this abundance possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> Officers, delegates, and guests of this 60th convention. Once again, I am glad to take part in the cooperative business panel along with the other regional representatives, my very good friend, Jerry and Ed. I would like at this time to ask the two South Dakota directors Norman Olson and Phil Testerman to stand, please. <clears throat> we also have some uh, field representatives and managers here in various parts of the building. Will you please stand? <clears throat> uh, 
I've been <clears throat> around a long, long time, as Ben indicated. I started at 12. That's how I can have almost 30 years in. And I should know better by this time. He gave me the opportunity of speaking first because I was something about protocol or something. And Jerry gave you my speech, so I should sit down, really. Uh, <clears throat> But I would like to, this afternoon, to give you a brief report on our progress in grain marketing, the past crop year, and how things are going for this year. Here in the upper Midwest, we have had three years of better demand for our crops, which makes farming attractive again, with young men wanting to stay on the farm, if they can, for farmers have always done a tremendous job, but they never got paid for it. Now things are better, and we hope that they will stay that way. But we will have this kind of market, we hope, until the end of this fall. But a year after that, I wish we knew. That's why we have to work through our cooperatives, our farm organizations, our state and federal governments, and our political parties. We have not only next year's farm prices to worry about, but for the many, many years ahead. There are operating costs that keep going up as better organized groups raise their prices the shortages of some farm supplies, the shutdown in transportation just when farmers need it most, the government embargoes, the environmental no-nos, and the serious lack of understanding of so many Americans about the vital contribution of farmers to our nation and to our world. All these require us to keep building our organizations such as the South Dakota Farmers Union, including our cooperatives, not only in this state, but in the entire world. The 1974 crops of corn and soybeans were cut down in this area by drought and flood. But this resulted in record prices for feed cattle, which offset the short crop for many growers. Most local elevators had a pretty good year in 1974. That was the case with GTA also. We had a smaller volume of grain to market or process. Farmers and ranchers had to cut down on their feed purchases. But wheat prices worked lower. Wheat prices reached their peak on November 1, and then they dropped nearly $2 until June 20th. The Minneapolis price for spring wheat, 1315 protein, went from 572 to $3.87, or a loss of $1.85 a bushel. During the year, we were able to move a large part of our members' grain with the 720 hopper cars that we now lease. Many of these are assigned to local cooperatives, affiliated with GTA, and some are assigned to our line operations. <clears throat> These cars have helped greatly in keeping a steady move of grain from the country to our terminals. We were also able to move grain better because of the barge line that we own together with other regional grain cooperatives and farm cooperatives, including Senex. During the year, many local elevators took advantage of their better earnings to improve their plants by speeding up their activities, their capacity, or adding storage or other equipment. Many new modern elevators have been built, including some able to load unit trains. This new type of elevator is not yet thoroughly tested, but is likely to be used more in corn areas than in small grain areas. During the year, we had heavy exports to the West Coast, benefiting South Dakota grain growers, as well as those in western Minnesota, 
Much of our grain went down the Mississippi River to the Farmer's Export Elevator at New Orleans, which GTA owns jointly with five other regionals. Farmer's Export handled 170 million bushels of grain, mostly corn and soybeans, some wheat. Processing divisions in GTA also did well, meeting the demand for their many products. Our Honeymead Products Division crushes sunflowers and flaxseed at our Minneapolis, Minnesota plant and soybeans at our Mankato, Minnesota plant. The Mankato plant also refines and hardens soy and sunflower oil. We are now engaged in preliminary testing of margarine manufacturing using two small plants in the state of Missouri. And by this experience, we can judge the value of going further in that field. Sunflowers grown by GTA members under contract last year did not result in as much crushing as we had hoped, as many of them were sold to Europe when the crops were short. However, we did continue to produce sunflower oil to make one of the leading brands of margarine, Promise Margarine a product of Lever Brothers. We keep trying to hold our flaxseed market, which has been slowly losing out to paints made from petroleum. Those of you who raise malling barley will be glad to know that GTA's Freighter Division had an excellent year with our malting barley plants. <coughs> we are building a new barley elevator at Wapiton, North Dakota which will serve some South Dakota growers. We have also had good results with our Amber Mill Division, which is now in its 32nd year of grinding Durham wheat for GTA members. <coughs> GTA feeds kept a good volume, even with lower cattle prices and smaller hog numbers. That was due to growth support of more and more farmers and ranchers for GTA. We are building a new feed plant now at Dickinson, North Dakota, and this plant will serve cooperatives and individual customers in northwestern and north central South Dakota. GTA's Great Plains Supply Company has continued to make many improvements in the GPS yards in South Dakota and elsewhere. We have very good support at the Brookings, South Dakota yard. We are now putting construction centers into many of our yards where we make all kinds of trusses and wall panels, which makes construction of homes and farm buildings much simpler. We're going to build new yards at Beersford and at Arlington, South Dakota, to replace the existing yards there. <coughs> As I mentioned before, GTA savings were very good, just as those of most local elevators. The auditors are now finishing that report. Before long, patronage savings will be sent to local elevators and to the line patrons. However, as always, the full details of GTA's year will be reported to the GTA annual meeting, which this year is Tuesday and Wednesday, December 2nd and 3rd, and we're looking for all of you to come and pay us a visit. <clears throat> You'll be glad to know that the GTA board has ordered us to continue retiring the accumulated savings in GTA of everyone who is 72 and has sold his farm. Although South Dakota did have a good record wheat crop, the U.S. crop was tremendous. By far the largest that we have ever had. And we are going to have a record corn crop as well. With these big crops, there has been a very heavy movement of grain since harvest. For instance, the Burlington Northern Railroad, which carries the biggest part of this area's grain, set new monthly records for moving that commodity, both in August and September. The bigger supply of large hopper cars is responsible for these records, plus better management at our terminals. Even then, there have been embargoes on terminals, including ours at Superior, Wisconsin. But these have been short. 
Unfortunately, private business is furnishing the railroad with its cars. It's not uncommon today to see an entire train going down the tracks with leased hopper cars that are owned by everybody else except the railroad, including GTA. Our barge shipments down the Mississippi River have also set records this year, partly because we have new barges and partly because we now have river elevators, two in St. Paul and one at Winona. This makes GTA more nearly equal to our competitors on the river. All told, the grain movement is going smoothly in sharp contrast with two or three years ago when there were many, many problems. This better handling has meant steadier markets this year at least so far. I would like to touch on some of the things which need to be done by grain producers and their cooperatives. Although farmers and local cooperatives have done a great job of building grain storage and drying equipment in the country and at their many terminal elevators, a lot remains to be done to have the kind of cooperative marketing system that farmers need. First among our needs is to get more of a foothold in the export market. Farmers must have a big and steady export markets, and cooperatives must do their share in getting these markets. Today, we have a number of regionals, each doing a little exporting while they compete against each other. Cooperatives must move toward one nationwide export company, equipped with enough, enough elevators on all coasts with highly skilled grain experts having worldwide information at their service. Two steps are underway today in this direction. First, we have been working with three other regionals to get joint use of a cooperative elevator at Portland, Oregon, so we can better serve our Japanese and other Oriental markets. We are making progress. We open an office, GTA opened an office in Portland July 1st. A second need is for a cooperative export terminal on the Texas Gulf Coast to serve our wheat growers, from whom New Orleans is too far away. There are existing two Texas cooperative port elevators today, but they are not available to our growers. That's why Farmers Export, to which we belong, is now planning to build their own. This will take time, but it will put wheat growers from Kansas north in a much better position to ship through the Gulf of Mexico. Without waiting for these two important export projects to be completed, we in GTA and the other members of Farmers Export Company are working to get more direct sales to Europe, including Eastern Europe and to Russia. We hope to have contracts soon, which could be the beginning of valuable markets for our cooperative members' grain to go directly from farm to overseas consumers, as we are doing already with the Japanese. I'm happy to report today, I don't have any details, but GTA had two grain merchandisers in Russia last week. We need to have the U.S. grain inspection and weight system tightened up so that co-ops are not at a disadvantage from dishonesty. U.S. farmers need long-time agreements with our principal customers so that we have some idea of what to produce and how to plan marketing for the future. That's why the new long-term agreement with Japan and those being worked on with Russia, Poland, and other Eastern European countries are big steps toward a better day for U.S. grain farmers. There are several other questions which rest upon, with, rest upon action by Washington the settling of international reserves, the level of price supports for grain, the maintenance of rail service of branch lines, the replacement of the key lock and dam, number 26 on the Mississippi River, just above St. Louis. I don't know how many of you people know about lock 26 at Alton, Illinois, but it's falling apart. And all the grain 
that moves down the Mississippi from north of St. Louis must pass through this lock. All the supplies coming up the river must pass through this lock. This lock could go out within an hour. I think that you should wire your senators and your congressmen of the seriousness of lock and dam number 26 at Alton, Illinois, and encourage immediate action to replace it because it would mean chaos to agriculture in all the states served by the river system north of, Miss of St. Louis, Missouri. There is plenty for farmers and ranchers to do through their co-ops. Help with their job of feeding America and the world. I believe grain farmers want to keep on building their cooperative marketing system until they have one national export cooperative that can compete on an equal basis with the big international company. That is both possible and highly desirable. You've come a long way. And now we have the chance to complete the job. It's there for us to do. I am sure GTA and its members will do its share of getting the job done, as you will do your share as a farm organization, getting the job done for yourselves, for your neighbors, and for the people that are starving all over the world. Thank you very much friends and members of the Farmers Union, South Dakota. I commented to uh, my good friends Jerry and Barney as we were walking up here, we had all this VIP treatment, got our directors to help escort us up here. We were sort of locked in tight step uh, formation. I said I felt like I was going to the chair. But it's always a pleasure to come to South Dakota. I haven't been here for a couple of years. And it is uh, a rare opportunity for those of us who must look after the business uh, organizations uh, of your farmers' union. Uh, it is one of our crosses to bear that we don't have the opportunity to spend as much time with the people at the grassroots as we would like to. Before I begin my remarks, I would like to introduce uh, the directors of FUMPA from uh, South Dakota, uh, Harvey Falstitch. Leif Lunder and George Levine, will you stand right down there? And I have one of my staff members with me also, a, a longtime friend of the Farmers Union of South Dakota, uh, Lloyd Larson, area representative from Brookings. Uh, George Levine uh, is uh, no stranger to you people. He is a replacement for the balance of the term, uh, which was uh, tragically vacated by the death of Frank Butler. I know that uh, you people have already expressed your feelings toward Frank, the great affection that you held him in uh, by the recognition given to him in your annual report booklet. But I want to add mine to those already expressed. Frank was a longtime personal friend of mine for over 20 years. And aside from his great contributions to the Farmers Union, I will miss very deeply his friendship. The fiscal year of our organization ended uh, June 30, and uh, as Barney uh, indicated, uh, the process of bringing all the books into line and uh, making a full disclosure of the results of our operations are not yet available. But uh, it looks like we had a reasonably good year, uh, not near as good as the last two years, certainly not as good as the year just previous, because uh, sales and commissions as well as earnings are a good deal lower. Uh, the, this reflects the much lower market prices for livestock and for byproducts. I am pleased to comment on the educational funds that we pay this year, although not near the kind of uh, a relationship uh, to the total of educational funds paid to your organization as was uh, indicated by uh, my good friend Jerry. Uh, still, uh, we don't have a great deal of cooperative activity in South Dakota, 
affiliated with Farmers Union Marketing and Processing Association. And I can tell you with all of the, the uh, feeling that I can muster that I wish it were more. I wish it were more because I know that it will be put to a very good purpose. The Central Byproduct Division, which is our processing uh, rendering operations, had record volume this year due to a very tragic condition. Uh, the series of violent winter storms that we have, in fact, uh, the worst ones in our 25-year history, I guess, uh, wiped out a tremendous number of livestock, not only in South Dakota, but in uh, the two other states in which we uh, received raw materials of that type for processing. The plant at DeSmet, South Dakota, operated literally around the clock for months in order to keep up with the tremendous volume of dead stock that came in, not only from this immediate area, but from all over the state. And we uh, even brought some material down from uh, the state of, of North Dakota where we don't have a rendering plant. And the trucks and the people were just absolutely taxed to the maximum in order to continue giving this kind of service to the livestock producers of the state. You know, the rendering uh, industry doesn't always enjoy the greatest image with people because they don't understand exactly the kind of service that this industry provides. But I think, especially where producers are concerned, that any questions that ever might have been had about the value of rendering services to producers certainly were answered this last season. Not only uh, in the saving of tremendous costs of burial and disposal that would have been the problem of the producer if it hadn't been for the renderer, but when you consider the tremendous hazard from the standpoint of animal as well as human health that uh, is represented, uh, represented by something like 76 million pounds of this material that would be laying out in the countryside if the renderer weren't there to provide this kind of service. And while I'm on that subject, I want to pay a special tribute to the representatives of the South Dakota Department of Agriculture and the State Highway Patrol who gave us a great deal of assistance without which we would not have been able to provide that service for you. In the Livestock Marketing Division, we see a tremendous uh, increase in commissions uh, at both of our South St. Paul and West Fargo terminals. Now, this is a result of a significant shift back to the terminals because uh, the farmers, the producers, lost, have lost a great deal of their uh, country markets. And this is uh, not, and while we're certainly happy to see the development, we, we, we're happy to have the opportunity to serve the producers in the area, uh, the one thing that is a little bit unsettling is the fact that it is a kind of a cyclic thing. Every time the producer loses the country markets, he looks for the terminal uh, markets to sort of bail him out. And as I've said before, uh, this isn't something that we can take lightly because one day it is not going to be possible for the livestock producer to look to the terminals because without a steady volume of business that provides the kind of income necessary to keep the business in business, uh, it may not be possible always to have the terminal markets available for this purpose. Now, the question is always asked me, well, don't you expect this kind of shifting and changing uh, of pattern by livestock producers. After all, all other businesses do that. They, they, uh, they patronize their, or they, they buy or they sell wherever they can get the best price or, or income advantage, depending on uh, what the current market conditions are. Well, I, uh, uh, especially this, uh, in, in, in light of recent events, the last uh, year, I would just simply answer that question by uh, asking another question. How much price guaranteed you have, or how much profit would you enjoy unless you have some kind of a guaranteed price? Uh, the processor that goes broke, owing something like two and a, and a half million dollars to livestock producers for livestock that has already been slaughtered on the retail shelves, if not already in the consumer stomach, uh, is not a... Um, is not a profitable, profitable venture for livestock producers. Another question, how much profit can you hope for when the retailer and the wholesaler conspire to set prices uh, that are uh, set for their advantage irrespective of what the producer needs to, to make a profit or to stay in business, uh, much less 
uh, make a profit. Now, uh, these are things that happen. They're against the law. We know that, but they're going on all the time. Unfortunately, the evidence is not always as flagrant and as apparent and as provable as was the case in the, uh, the West Coast uh, food chains, uh, which, in which the courts ordered the uh, food chains to pay back to the producers involved something like $35.8 million. Now, you're, I'm going to be followed on the program here this afternoon by a gentleman by the name of Homer Ayers, who is well known to you. Uh, he has a report that uh, was made available to me, and I read that report last night. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to study it as I would like to have, just as well because I don't want to comment on it. I don't want to take anything away from Homer Ayers' report. All I can say is that it should be required reading in every agricultural college and every uh, agricultural economics class in the country. It should be, re the consumer group should buy it up and make a pamphlet out of it and circulate it to every person in this country that considers himself a consumer and is concerned about food prices. Because in that report, you'll find the story of why food prices are as high as they are and why farmers are going broke at the same time. I would suggest that the representative of the uh, labor organization that will address this convention on tomorrow also be given a copy of that pamphlet and that he be in, uh, sug uh, that a suggestion be made to him that it be reproduced and given to his members. And perhaps we ought to send one to the Longshoremen's Union and to George Meany. And while we're at it, let's send one to President Ford because that's exactly where the decisions are going to be made anyway. It's a little bit difficult in the light of these kinds of developments not to sound angry because I am angry. And I understand farmers' anger in light of these kinds of things, and they must be changed. We're talking about the survival. No, we're talking about the preservation of the meat producing industry in America, not just one court case. And what happened in this particular instance, as your keynote speaker and I were talking about earlier this morning, is just a part of a whole pattern of what's going on in the food marketing and pricing industry in this country. And we better find out what exactly is going on and do something to stop it. Producers can't support this type of so-called free enterprise system because if they do, they always find out that they provide the enterprise and the profit merchants get it for free. Now, there's not a great deal of defense in shopping around. Uh, there isn't any amount of price spread that you could get if you market your livestock direct, in this instance, or Barney in the case of, of, of uh, the grains, if they find the various marketing me methods and all of the different representatives that come out and, and, and price the, uh, the commodities. There isn't any kind of price spread that is going to make up the difference between the kind of thing, the kind of price that, that you could get in a free market situation if these mechanisms were uh, operated as they should be operated and the kind of ripoff, as Homer Ayers calls it, that was uh, exemplified in the situation which he will talk more about this afternoon. And of course, there's always the aftermath. There's always the tendency to Get the salvage crews out. Now we're going to, we're going to correct this situation. Uh, we see a spate of new laws that are going to require prompt payment and uh, new antitrust agreements and all of this kind of thing. And I say to that, it is useless if you don't apply it in a way that it applies to everyone in the economic chain of movement of the material from the producer to the ultimate consumer. If it is not applied equally, if the laws are not enforced, forget it. You might just as well save the time. You can pass all the laws you want to. They still depend on the spirit and good faith of all those involved. And we've already learned that there's not a great deal. Of, there's a lot of spirit, but there's not a lot of good, good faith on the part of some of the people along that chain. There is one very humorous thing in all of this. Recently, we've seen a, a great uh, deal of interest in co-op legislation, Jerry, 
such as the Justice Department is now carrying on with regard to examining the antitrust aspects of the Kepler Volstead Act. And that I find a little bit laughable in, in the light of the, of the kind of thing that I was just talking about here and that Homer Ayers will elaborate on some more. Be it's it's, it is uh, laughable because the American farmer, whether he realizes it or not, this is the only, this is the only defense he has, the only mechanism he has is his cooperative. So I say to the livestock producers, there is one simple way that we can approach some kind of a solution to this problem of price and, and income to, uh, to the producers, while at the same time eliminating some of these hazards that I've talked about. And that is to deal with our own organi organizations at the government regulated public markets that are represented by the Farmers Union Marketing and Processing Association. In my opinion, I certainly echo, echo the comments that were made by the two gentlemen that just preceded me. Farmers need to get a lot closer to their cooperatives. They own them and they can control them, but the only way they're going to get a lot closer to them is to patronize those cooperatives and support what those cooperatives represent. represent. And I think that cooperatives need to be a great deal closer to their farmers' organization and I must say, uh, Ben, I was very in encouraged, and I think that, uh, that more cooperatives ought to follow the example of the Bearsford Cooperative, which just voted to put the full 5% educational fund and to check off dues to this organization. Now, this fight is just not uh, in, in the co-op way of, do uh, of doing business. This fight that we are in represents who will own and control the American food production machinery in this country. And we're in this fight together, as Barney said. Now, I'm going to cut my remarks short because I see I'm already infringing on my, my uh, successor's time here. Uh, what does the future hold as far as the livestock producer is concerned? I don't have a crystal ball. If I could answer that question, I wouldn't come to meetings like this. I wouldn't have time. You people would be calling me up and coming to my house to get some good sage, sage advice. Hopefully, we're at near the end of the current cycle. And that's kind of a bad thing to hope for because we're at the top of the cycle at the, at the present time. But really, that's the whole problem that is faced by the food producer, in this case, the livestock producer, and something that we're going to have to do something about. The problem is cycles. And we should concentrate on solving that problem and not just the symptom of prices. Because when we, have, when we attack the symptom of prices, the farmer gets all concerned about it when prices are low. And the consumer gets excited about it when the, when the prices are high. And we need the interest of both to approach this problem of eliminating these cycles, these wide fluctuations between uh, the oversupplies and the, the uh, shortages. So I don't believe this is, is difficult, as some of the great uh, seers of this country have said it is. And I just think it's something that we ought to uh, take on as a project. And the first step is that farmers are going to have to say we, they don't anymore believe in the old tradition of cycles, of short uh, and oversupplies, and that, the, uh, that these are inevitable. And the next step, we have to exercise a great deal more self-discipline than has been uh, evident by the producers of, uh, of uh, our, uh, our food in this country, and I don't think that's impossible. Here again, farmers have an organization through which they can express these kinds of concerns and through, to which they can give their ideas and their help to solve some of these very difficult problems. You need to address these questions together, and that's what I think is so significant about having your co-op uh, organizations represented on your program. Hopefully, you will bring yourself somewhat closer to the, some of these decisions to resolve these very crucial matters during this convention. Thank you very much. How do we get a great plain supply in this area? Um, it goes on a little bit here. It appears that GTA is putting more employees on business profits than on service to members more emphasis on business profit than on service to members. Is this a wise course to follow? Um, is big better? That's the question. Uh, Mr. Molosky, we'll turn that one over to you. 
I always get the easy ones. Well, if, if a survey would prove that a lumber yard could be profitably operated in this area, you'll get one. And I don't think that GTA is putting more emphasis on business profits than on service to members. Number one, you cannot run a business, whether it be private or cooperative, at a loss. You have to have money to improve your facilities if you're going to be competitive. And as far as bigness is concerned, we're not one-tenth big enough now. If we were, you'd, you'd have a better marketing system. The 18 regional cooperatives that make up the National Federation of Cooperatives, if they were merged together, they'd be about as big as Cargill. So I don't think that your marketing system is half big enough. Thank you. Uh, for Mr. Whelan, would you say that with the livestock prices that we, the farmers, receives in South Dakota, it would pay us more money to ship our livestock through FUMPA? And then it goes on, would transportation eat up more money than we would receive by shipping to them. I'll trade you yours for mine. But I find that an almost impossible question to answer. Your closest market, uh, depending on the area that you're in, the closest market that you're at, uh, as far as the FUMPA is concerned, is South St. Paul. Uh, or it could be West Fargo, depending if you're up in the northeast corner of, of the state. Uh, I think that my, uh, my experience would indicate that you'd be a whale of a lot better off if you shipped to the, south, uh, to the terminal at Sioux Falls. Uh, because uh, uh, I know uh, some of the conditions under which uh, livestock is purchased in the country. And as far as the transportation is concerned, assuming that the first assumption is correct, and I believe that it is, uh, as far as uh, the transportation is concerned, you're paying it. You may not think you're paying it, but you're paying it. When you get the price in the country, it's based on what it's going to cost to move that material to the place where it's going to be used. There isn't any Santa Claus in this business. And there's a reason why people are in the country making their purchases rather than at the, ter at the public terminals, and that is because it is at, of an advantage to them. The uh, surveys that have been made indicate that the most expensive way for a processor to buy livestock is in the country. He sends a man out there and he has to pay his expenses, he has to pay the telephone calls, and he has to pay for all the costs, the mileage and everything, and if he can do that and still buy this material at an advantage, then he has, still has to assemble it out there in smaller lots and put it together and send it to wherever he's going to slaughter it. If he can do that and do it cheaper, then he can buy the livestock at a terminal where he can buy as much as he wants at one time and put them together in big packs and send them off, then he really is a miracle worker. I guess that's the only way I can answer that question. Thank you, Mr. Whelan. Um, if there are any more questions on, on papers that you people have, if you would put your names and addresses on them, you will get an answer. We note that most of these that are up here now don't have a name and address, so we're going to try and get through these if we can. Uh, the next question here would be for uh, Mr. Jerry Tweet. There are two of them. They're both quite similar. Uh, the first one is why the big spread in LP gas prices in some areas? And this other question is from someone else. Why do some co-op oil stations charge six cents per gallon more for gas than some stations located only two or three blocks further on? And it goes on, Can, can't co-ops compete with other companies anymore? Gary? First of all, why the big spread in LP gas prices in some areas? This is primarily due to its origin Canada, as you know, has taken on the philosophy that all of their natural resources 
will be sold at high prices if anybody wants to buy them because they belong to the people and they intend to get a lot for them. And I guess we can't badmouth them or complain about that. But if a supplier here in the United States is buying all of their LP gas from Canada, rather than having domestic suppliers, their gas will be higher priced if they take the same amount of margin. Now, freight comes into play some, but, but not very much per gallon of LP gas. It's primarily the supplier. Why do some co-op oil stations uh, uh, take six cents a gallon more for the gas than other stations located uh, two, three blocks away or possibly in the same town? I guess that that's a, a, a question that, uh, that we could talk about a long time this afternoon. There's no doubt that some stations may take more margin than others. Certainly some stations give a lot more service than others. If you have a, a little uh, uh, office building, maybe with two pumps in front, you might have a $10,000 uh, investment related to one down the street that gives full service that might have a, a $220,000 investment. There probably will be some difference in prices, at least until uh, until uh, uh, a new station might be depreciated down to a degree. There's a lot of different reasons why uh, prices vary among stations. They vary among co-op stations, and they vary among stations that are owned by investor-oriented companies. And there's many, many different reasons. I might say on the LP gas situation that uh, as far as Senex is concerned, and this question I presume uh, referred to Senex, we have different prices in different areas. We buy some LP gas out of uh, domestically here in the United States. Uh, we uh, uh, store it in, in salt mines, a lot of it down in Kansas, so that we have enough when it gets cold. We've got enough to take care of the surge. We also get a lot out of Canada that's quite expensive. We try and blend those two prices together. Thank you. Uh, the next question is addressed to Mr. Malosky. Do you have facilities for direct exports, or do you go through Cargill and so on? If so, why? And do you in turn sell to Cargill or other companies? As I mentioned in my report to you that yes, we do have, uh, uh, we have an elevator for direct export through Farmers Export in New Orleans, Louisiana. <coughs> that elevator is running at capacity, absolute full capacity. We have no choice but to sell to other companies and go through cargo and so forth because the farmer's marketing system isn't large enough to handle the bushels. It's that simple. I had one handed to me, if you don't mind, uh, by the young lady here. They'll just take a second. The question is, do you think Ford, and I assume she's speaking about President Ford, not Henry Ford, will really allow foreign grain sales? Yes, he's going to allow foreign grain sales because he has no other choice. There's no question about it. But hopefully, he will handle the foreign grain sales not to drive down farm prices, but to have orderly marketing with a fair price to the farmer. But he's going to allow them, no question about it. Thank you. Um, next question is addressed to Mr. Wheeland. Question reads, what is FOMPA doing to raise prices of livestock? What are dead animals worth to patrons? Do they get any compensation or dividends on that action? I shortened up my comments earlier, as I said, because the hours late, you have a lot of very important matters to deal with on your program. Uh, one of the uh, new uh, programs that we are, I call it an experiment, because really it hasn't been too well proven uh, at this point. One of the experiments that we're conducting at the present time is a project in which we guarantee a, what we call guarantee profit for hogs. And uh, we do that. It's through a contract uh, arrangement. The only problem is we just nicely got it launched about the time that the hog prices took off like a, a skyrocket. And there aren't very many people rushing around at this point uh, expecting us to help them lock in a profit for hogs. They're doing it pretty well all by themselves. 
hopefully uh, when sit the marketing situation returns to a more normal pattern uh, that we will be able to interest uh, many more hog producers in locking in a profit for their hogs and it is our intention as this project develops and proves to be successful and beneficial to the small producers and I should say I emphasize small producers because uh, the large producers already have this kind of uh, marketing mechanism available to them uh, but as we prove that it can be done through an organization such as ours on behalf of small producers it isn't our purpose or intention to expand this operation in, to include uh, livestock as well uh, there is nothing that an organization such as ours can do to raise prices this is not our responsibility it is not within our capability to do what are dead animals worth to patrons well if you had to bury the dead animals, uh, it would be worth a great deal. Uh, and I'm sure that the, in the state of South Dakota, it's true as it is in Minnesota. There's only three ways that you can dispose of a dead animal in Minnesota and stay out of jail. You can either burn them, you can bury them, or you can send them to a rendering company. So when you look at the free service that's provided by the rendering company, the value to the producer is considerable. And I did make one other point which I think should be considered. When the material is removed from your farm, it is done in such a manner that it virtually, uh, uh, it doesn't eliminate, but it certainly minimizes the possibility of spread of uh, disease to other animals and certainly to humans as well. So when you consider that cost, uh, it is also considerable. I might point out one thing. I've been with this organization for nearly nine years. At that time, we removed the animals from your farm uh, free of charge. Now, nine years later, our costs of operating our rendering plants has uh, nearly uh, doubled, in some instances tripled. And we're still removing those animals from your farm uh, absolutely free. Now, if that isn't an inflation fighter, I don't know what is. Thank you, Mr. Whelan. I've got a double shot for Jerry Tweet here. I see we're running short on time, so I'm going to double this one up. I'll read both of them and then turn them over to him. Where is Senex getting its major supply of gas and farm tractor fuel and heating fuel? Now that's on one. The other one reads, how do you replace a manager who has no interest in co-ops in general? He never attends any meetings, conventions, or anything of interest to the co-op members. Board of directors are no help either. I'll let him fight that one over a little bit. Well, I'll take the easy one first. Uh, Senex uh, today is, is refining about 31,000 barrels of crude oil per day at the Laurel Refinery, and this amounts to about a million three hundred thousand gallons a day. So that's where a million three hundred thousand gallons each and every day, seven days a week comes from. As you probably know, Senex owns one third interest in National Co-op Refinery Association in McPherson, Kansas. There we get about 20,000 barrels a day, and that's about 830,000 gallons each and every day. In addition to that, we have to buy on the outside about 5,000, an additional 5,000 barrels a day. So that's where all of the fuel comes from. And the fuel that you use may not come directly from the Laurel or the McPherson refinery. It may be traded somewhere along the way so that there will be a savings in freight. But of course, it's all up to a certain specification as far as quality. As far as replacing a manager who's not interested in co-ops in general, and I agree, if he's not interested in co-ops in general, he should be replaced. And I don't know what to tell you other than, uh, than, than, than the board of directors of that local cooperative, of course, that are his bosses, should see to it that he's replaced. We have a, uh, a state area manager, as you well know, in each state, and we also have a marketing supervisor, district supervisor in each district that would also be willing to uh, uh, help in some way or other without trying to get you guys in the middle. But uh, that, that, of course, is also an avenue. Uh, I really don't know, uh, Ken, uh, how to answer that in any more detail than that. Thank you. We have we're running short on time. Ben says we can have one more, so I picked one here. It's uh, addressed to Senex or GTA, and I think I'll turn it over to Mr. Molusky. 
The question reads, do you consider railroad transportation important in the future now in agriculture and industry? We have lost between five and 600 miles to abandonment in our state and over 300 miles additional are up for abandonment now. What can we do about the railroad situation? Barney? I recognize the writing on this and I get letters from him all the time. <laughs> How are you, Emil? <laughs> yes, we're very concerned about the abandonment of railroad lines and we, about a year and a half or two years ago, time flies, we hired a gentleman and you know him, Andy Nelson, to work in this field for GTA. It's a very, very difficult problem because the railroads can, in fact, and I don't approve of the way they run the railroads, uh, prove to ICC that they're operating a branch line at a loss and of course they go through all the hearings and get the thing railroaded through. What the solution is, I don't know, other than to get up in arms about it. And I think you're doing that in the state of South Dakota. You're, you're doing a good job. And, and we are willing to help. And as I say, we do have this expert, and any time you need him, you call him, or we'll sure give him to you to help you out. So we are concerned, and we are doing what we can about it. It's a very difficult job. The railroads, of course, as you know, are against the uh, lock and dam 26 at Alton, Illinois. They don't want that rebuilt. If that baby goes out, they can't do the job now. Think of the chaos you're going to have. We're very much opposed to the abandonment of railroads and doing what we can. Thank you. Uh, there are more questions listed here that we won't have time to go into right now, but I, possibly after the meeting this afternoon, if you get a chance to visit with any of these three panelists, they can...